Sacrifice by everybody. What could it do to you except reflect your image? I did nothing wrong at the Minneapolis airport. The Majority Report. Far more credible to me than PBS and Frontline. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday. October 11th, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, McKay Coppins, The Atlantic Magazine, Writing in the Columbia Journalism Review, What If the Right-Wing Media Wins? Also on the program today, Republicans in the bunker mentality. Meanwhile, the generals worry about Trump and nukes. 1,000-plus ISIS fighters surrender to the Kurds. And a transpartisan bill introduced in the House to withdraw from Yemen. Harvey Weinstein, done, ladies and gentlemen. And the United Labor Union files a complaint versus the Cowboys owner over forcing his players to stand for the national anthem. Lastly, Mark Zuckerberg apologizes Still doesn't get it. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's just play this quick clip here because um, I don't know if there's anything that sums up where we're at quite like this when the spokesperson for the State Department. <laughs> Actually, there's multiple clips that I guess <laughs> suggest this. Um, this is a spokesperson from uh, the State Department. She's the former Fox News morning personality, of course, turned State Department spokeswoman. And, uh, well, she is asked a question about the Secretary of State. Um. Apropos of nothing, what's the secretary's IQ? <laughs> it's high. Is Anybody it? who can put put things together, you know, when it's an you engineer, don't, you, don't, you don't have a. It's high. You I don't. don't you, I don't, you don't have, have an exact that. score. You know, what, he, what, what, what he might have gotten on his SATs, anything like that? No. Do you have a real question? Yeah, Turkey. Right. Apparently, that is a real question. The president uh, was making assertions about their relative IQs. So that became important. That's just give you a sense. Um, and for those of you who watch uh, or listen to this program uh, overseas, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, all right, you know, we got time for one more that uh, I think captures this. But before we do, I want to talk about this because um, before we get to uh, McKay Coppins, um, 
as you know, as far as I was concerned uh, last year, at this time, that if you didn't need, if you needed, or I should say, one needed no other reason to vote for Hillary Clinton for president over Donald Trump than that one seat on the Supreme Court. And then you can layer in from there the next seat on the Supreme Court and perhaps the next one after that. And the hundred some odd plus federal judiciary vacancies, which are now, incidentally, uh, significantly more than just a hundred. They're at 149 vacancies. Upcoming resignations will put the vacancies to 166. You will have entire federal circuit benches filled with a majority of Republicans for at least a generation, maybe two. And writing in, I don't know where this guy writes. Fred Barnes, apparently, also, I should say, is still alive. And uh, he is writing. And this is indicative of the bunker mentality that the Republicans are in right now. Later in the program, we'll talk about what's happening with uh, the other Republican lawmakers. But this is the most important aspect of what's going on. Aside from, of course, Donald Trump perhaps may be getting us into some type of nuclear confrontation. Mitch McConnell has made it the number one priority of the Senate to confirm judicial nominees. They're not as worried about legislation. They're not worried about filling the assistant secretary of state. Or the other literally, I don't know, it could be hundreds of positions that still need confirmation in our government. The only thing they care about is getting as many judges sitting on the federal bench as possible. So he is scheduling that, making those a priority. He's also no longer honoring blue slips. You will recall there was a huge logjam of judges under the Obama administration because it has been Senate tradition for I don't know how many decades that the senator of a state in which a judge is up for confirmation on any given circuit. Now, remember how many states Republicans control can withhold a blue slip of paper, I guess, and essentially make that nomination go nowhere if they disagree with the judge. This was done constantly, constantly when Democrats controlled the Senate. Uh, many people said to Patrick Leahy, who was the chair of the Judicial um, Judiciary uh, Committee in the Senate, don't honor these anymore. And of course, the institutionalism uh, won out until, of course, Mitch McConnell became uh, the Senate leader. The use of blue slips, he said, is not a Senate rule. It's been honored in the breach over the years. Now it won't be honored at all. Technically, you need uh, Grassley, who is the chair of the Judiciary Committee, to also kill it, but they'll do it. He's also getting rid of uh, or at least uh, bypassing the 30 hours rule, uh, which provides for 30 hours of debate on a nominee. He's going to figure out how to do that uh, scheduling wise. And yet he's still getting grief from various conservative outlets that want to get rid of him. Uh, from the Judicial Crisis Network, from the Conservative Action Project. Freedom Works is demanding McConnell step down. Uh but he knows why he's there. And this is the, this is essentially like this is the moment where you're in the bunker. 
you see the uh, the tanks coming from the attacking army and you start burning all of the papers in there. This is what he's doing. He's got 13 months, 14, 15 months now until January of 2019 when there's a slight, slight, highly unlikely, but possible chance that they would lose the Senate. And this is what they want to get accomplished. Literally decades of conservative control of the federal judiciary. I don't care what proposals you think you have for government. If five justices of the Supreme Court say, hey, guess what? Single payer? That's not constitutional. It won't happen. And I don't think we're get, we I don't think we have those five justices now. We don't. If Kennedy leaves or one of the liberal judges left the center, let's say judges leave, um, you're going to get close to five judges who will say that. If two of them leave, that's Johnny Ballgame until someone gets hit by a bus. For anybody who's alive hearing my voice now, anyways. Because a 45-year-old sitting on that court is going to be there for 40 years. So just keep that in mind um, if you have a time machine and can go back in time <laughs> and need to reevaluate your vote in Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania in particular. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Um, well, you know what? Let's play one more clip here because this is also indicative of what's going on. Gabe Sherman was on Chris Hayes last night, and I think what's happening is that Bob Corker is shaking loose some stories that we wouldn't otherwise hear. And... Um, Nobody's coming out. There's no elected Republican official in the country who is not resigning that is going to speak out against Donald Trump because something like 96% of those people who voted for Donald Trump in the Republican primary would vote for him again today. And I think when we talk to McKay Coppins, we're going to understand why. But the stories are starting to shake loose a little bit, and uh, they're, of course, all anonymously sourced. But Gabe Sherman's been pretty good with his sources in the past. I think there's a half a dozen people at uh, Fox or formerly at Fox News who would agree with that assessment. Uh, here he is. He's now. Uh, he's not with Variety, is he? No. Gabe Sherman isn't with. Vari no, I think he's with. Um, maybe he is. Here he is um, uh, on Chris Hayes' program. I just want to, you know, sort of put into context a conversation I had with a very prominent Republican today who literally was saying that they imagine uh, General Kelly and Secretary Mattis have had conversations about if Trump lunged for the nuclear football, what would they do? Would they tackle him? I mean, literally physically restrain him from putting the country at sort of perilous risk. And that is the kind of situation we're in. And so, yes. Wait, that's a conversation you have with a very senior Republican yes. musing about what who they knows would do. That, who is talking about these are the conversations that they have very very good I, I, authority are taking place inside the White House. That's a little disturbing. That's a little disturbing, I guess. I don't know. I guess it would be more disturbing if we heard, like, people think he's going to lunge for the nuclear football and nobody's going to stop him. Or they, like, installed, like, a Fox News app on the nuclear football that he can watch. That would be more disturbing. But. That or Or they what would be less disturbing is that they figured out they're just going to surround the nuclear football with TVs <laughs> that will distract them as he gets closer. I do wonder if there's some type of protocol where if the president has said a certain word, like 
I want to, I command to see the nuclear football or something like that. Then the protocol is such that nobody can interfere with him. But they could literally tackle him before he gets to saying those words. I don't know. It's really uh, sad that we have to contemplate that. But uh, that's where we're at. Gabe Sherman, Vanity Fair. Uh, Somebody, I guess, uh, in the office was editorializing about uh, the quality of Vanity Fair. (laughs) All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, McKay Coppins. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program staff writer for the Atlantic magazine, contributing to the Columbia Journalism Review with the piece, What If the Right Wing Media Wins? McKay Coppins. McKay, welcome uh, to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. All right. I, you know, I have I am becoming increasingly obsessed again, as I was probably 10 10, 15 years ago uh, now to um, to the uh, the implications of the right wing media and 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 particularly in this day and age, because we have, you know, someone who could be a right wing media personality as president, uh, or at least it seems Mm -hmm. to get most of his talking points from there. And you make the argument that there has been. I mean, what is it? Just give me the broad stroke. Is it that there has been a a a sort of a fundamental shift in the agenda of the right wing media? Yeah, well, I think two things have happened. One is that the conservative media complex as a whole has in the past few years and especially in the Trump presidency become much larger, more powerful, more influential Uh, because we have a president, as you mentioned, who takes his cues from right-wing media. So that's one thing that's happened. The the second thing is that their agenda has shifted, um, or or at least they've become more overt about what their agenda has been all along in a way that I think is is potentially dangerous. And that's what I get into in this uh, Columbia Journalism Review article. It used to be, for a long time, the conservative media and conservatives in general, people like Rush Limbaugh, Fox News, they, they spend a lot of their time, as you know, attacking the mainstream media, uh, but, but they always at least claimed that they had a kind of civic-minded rationale for it. They said that our goal is to reform the mainstream media. What we want is a more fair and objective uh, news in this country. They, they said that it was too biased uh, toward liberals. Now, whether you thought that was disingenuous or not, I, I argue that it was at least there was value in in maintaining the pretense because it kind of supported the broad consensus we've had in this country since World War II that our country works best, our democracy works best with a robust nonpartisan press. Um, what's hap- what's changed in the last couple of years is that conservatives, especially kind of the ascendant figures uh, on the right wing uh, media have basically dropped that pretense. I start the piece with an anecdote with Matt Boyle, who's a Washington editor for uh, Breitbart. uh, And he's he's at the Heritage Foundation speaking to a bunch of young up-and-coming conservatives, uh, you know, the next generation of Tucker Carlson's and Megyn Kelly's. And he says, his quote is, journalistic integrity is dead. 
there is no such thing anymore. So everything is about weaponizing or the, or the weaponization of information. And he says, we envision a day when the New York Times closes its doors. We envision a day when CNN is no longer in business. They, they, he comes out and says, our goal is the complete destruction of the mainstream media, by which I think they mean basically the destruction of nonpartisan journalism. All right. So, you know, I mean, this is fascinating to me because, I mean, um, for a couple of reasons, because on, on some level, I, the reason why I'm doing this show came out of a desire on on some level to actually weaponize I- I information, obviously not from the right, right. but from the left. I mean, I, it's, I started my career uh, in, in AM talk radio. I subscribe to the notion that, in fact, um, this is not a fundamental shift, but it's just like stage three, right, of a, of a plan where, <laughs> sure. where you can be more explicit about it and, and, and you can afford to be because stages one and two of the plan were successful enough that you can actually articulate this, this, this agenda. I, I remember, you know, back uh, specifically when, uh, you know, a guy like Duncan Black, Atrios, would write in 2004, 2005, we, we have problems with the media. What the media doesn't understand is that when we attack them, we are actually just asking them to uphold certain editorial standards. When the mm -hmm. right attacks them, they're trying to get, they're trying to destroy them. And, right. and, and so, but I don't, but like you say, I don't know if that's as important other than the fact that I think the consensus was simply held up because the project had not moved along as much. Do you know what I, I mean? I think that that's... Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think there's something to that. I think that that's true. Um, and so maybe fundamental shift is not the right word. Like I said, I think a lot of this is just conservatives being more uh, transparent about what their goal has been all along. Um, but I do think that, I mean, we've seen it, you know, you can look at any number of metrics, but we've seen the, the deterioration of uh, the mainstream media's credibility, their financial stability over the last you know, decade, decade and a half. And there are a lot of things that have contributed to that. It's not just, you know, conservatives going after it. But I do think that, that, there, that the, the, the project now is to undermine journalism. And, and, and I yes. want to make a, make a point here before I move on. I don't think there's anything wrong with opinion journalism or and I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, just straight up, uh, you know, having an agenda and advocating for it with these media platforms, whether it's what you do or it's online or social media or or with, you know, whatever. It, that, that's all fine. That's part of the political process. I think that's good. I think the difference is that there are uh, people who <laughs> there are people on both left and right who are operating with good faith who want the, the mainstream media to be better and then also want to add their voice as a, as a voice of advocacy. Then there's what Breitbart and others are doing, which is they want to replace journalism itself with what they're doing. And I spent a lot of time talking to uh, conservative media figures for this piece, and, and they will tell you even the, the most kind of, uh, you know, responsible, the more responsible good faith actors in this world will say, look, the whole idea of media objectivity is kind of is a relatively new one. And, and the idea of a nonpartisan press has only emerged in the last you know, half century or so. And they, they kind of advocate for a return to the journalistic conventions of centuries past where uh, where, you know, news was delivered by publications that were essentially organs of political parties or ideological movements. So that's where a lot of them want to see the media landscape moving. Yeah, I think that is I think that point that. Um, they are working to undermine journalism, I think, is the key. And my answer to, you know, and I think it was uh, Ben Shapiro who made that point in your piece about, you know, uh, uh, neutral journalism is a, a relatively mm -hmm. new phenomenon. So isn't, I mean, to be fair, like, you know, um, indoor plumbing. You know, and and, and <laughs> right. things like antibiotics there are, and <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, a basic. There are a lot of relatively recent developments that we don't want to abandon as a society. Uh, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I do think that journalism, um, you know, uh, is uh, the, the idea of journalism, the idea of 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 reporting, um, and. You know, it's fine. I, I subscribe to the sort of the the and you mentioned uh, the the J um, 
Oh, gosh, I can't remember his name now, but um, a professor um, from NYU. Oh, Jay Rosen. Joe, Jay Rosen. Jay Rosen's yeah. perspective of like, you know, be transparent about the, the perspective mm-hmm. that you're coming from because everybody's a human being and, and you're going to come from some type of perspective. But the undermining, I think you're absolutely right, is the is the fundamental um, issue. And this, to me, seems also, and you track uh, the the attacks on on the press, um, you know, at the end, you give like a little bit of a timeline. But this has also been a major project. You look back to like someone like Gertrude Himmelfarb, Bill Crystal's mm-hmm. uh, mom, uh, was the attacks on science were, were, were rooted in the same idea that, that you don't want any type of objective arbor- arbiters to exist uh, mm-hmm. because then it much, it's much harder to make an argument. Yeah, no, and, the, and, and what, I, what I was kind of amazed by is the, um, you know, I talked to Ann Coulter for this piece, which uh, she's not a journalist, obviously, and, and I don't think considers herself one, uh, but, but she was basically pretty upfront about the, the, the reality of what you just said. She, she basically said, I, you know, I don't want any neutral, uh, you know, referees in the news landscape. I don't want people who are fact-checking and debunking falsehoods and adding context and not taking sides. Uh, She said, I want all of us to start arguing about issues and ideas and everyone has to take a side. And that, and that's, that's what'll be best for the country. I mean, that is an actual pretty popular and increasingly popular uh, worldview on the right. And I think that that is, that, that that's dangerous. It's super dangerous because, and the reason why, I mean, my, my speculation is to reason why that is a tenable position. I mean, and, and, and I wanted to ask you one, one question. I'll just put a pin in it for a second, but why I think that's a tenable position is because there's a lot more money for that project mm-hmm. on the yeah. right than there is on the left. It's not even, it's not even remotely close well, I, I think that that is true. I think that, part, you know, this piece goes through kind of the history of Republican efforts to undermine uh, journalism and, and the critiques of journalism. And, and I actually think some of their critiques have been fair over the years. But, the, but what that's yielded was a massive, comp, uh, you know, conservative news and media and information and entertainment complex with an explicit agenda and bias and a ton of money flowing toward it. And part of it is, you know, market demands. There have been conservatives who have been who, who have been frustrated with the mainstream media for a long time and have also been, frankly, conditioned pretty cynically by Republican politicians to, to not trust it. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, kind of murky money coming from billionaires, conservative billionaires, that goes toward funding these projects. And you're right. If you're a, if you're a young conservative uh, who wants to get into journalism and media and you're coming out of college, you kind of have a choice to make. And one choice, you know, one option is to go pursue a, a normal journalistic, uh, journalistic career. You go work at a newspaper or a, or a TV network. And the other is to go into the conservative media and often, especially at the beginning, those jobs that are offered at these conservative, these right wing uh, outlets are paying a lot more and promising a lot more visibility at the outset. And I think that that's why you see so many young conservatives going into it. And I and I think that's a phenomena. And I think the, the big thing that's changed that's allowed them uh, to be so explicit and to have grown in such power is social media. And I include in that like YouTube uh, and, and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and Facebook, I mean, these are platforms and, you know, guys, even like, you know, even the, the, the funding that goes to people ranging from like Gavin McGinnis to Dave Rubin, uh, yeah. you know, to the Breitbart radio, I mean, through the spectrum there. Okay. That comes from Koch brothers or comes from Mercer's or comes from people whose names I don't even know. You know, uh, <laughs> who drop, you know, $100,000, $50,000 can buy you a YouTube channel that, yep. you know, feeds into the entire sort of ecosystem in a way that, you know, it's like um, we're going to drop a, a hull of a ship off the, the coast of uh, the ocean and, <laughs> and just shit's just going to start building on it like a reef. 
Yeah, the, 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 this is a lot of this is just economics, right? The barrier to entry is so much lower to to have an influential uh, media outlet uh, than it was even you know 20 years ago. You don't have to buy a printing press. You don't have to. Uh, buy a, a TV station, uh, lay the groundwork. You don't have to have infrastructure. It, it really is. I mean, you, you have to have an internet connection and, and somebody to produce content, and often they come pretty cheap. This, this is part of the thing that worries me. It, it, part of the, the thing that I wrote is I tried to envision, kind of imagine what the world will look like if the right-wing media wins, if the people who want you know, nonpartisan journalism to just fade away. Well, what would that look like? And one of the things I think is that uh, that that will happen is that kind of inevitably the rich and powerful who can afford to buy and bankroll their own personal you know publications uh, will benefit the most because the, the, it's very easy to uh, you know have have buy influence in this kind of new media landscape. And I would argue because let me let me ask you this question then because this I think will bring out this point. I mean, if you had set out to do this exact same piece, but instead interviewed, you know, a left of center, center to, you know, to moving to the left, how do you think it would be different? Because, you know, people would say like, well, you know, Jeff Bezos, he's funding uh, the Washington Post. And my, but well, but exactly. But, you know, my argument is, (laughs) I mean, that's, this is what my argument would be like, there are not figures on the left who are willing to fund these type of projects like they are on the right. You know, like Air America launches, it didn't get a dime from the Democracy Alliance. Yeah. It didn't get, I don't know if we got even any, I don't even know if we got a dime even secondhand from Soros. It's just that type of stuff is distasteful on the left. And... In, I wonder. I mean, hasn't Soros though funded like non like, investigative journalism things? Well, well, I, I don't actually know enough. No, no, no. I think it. he that's, has. But that's my point: is that on the right, there are people who will fund using information, weaponizing information. Yeah, right. right. But on I the left, the, the, that analog doesn't exist. The projects exist. are fundamentally different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that it's funny because I wrote a piece a few months ago for the Atlantic, where where I it's my day job, about the kind of the to the extent that there was a parallel or kind of a corollary on the left it's very small right now right there are in the trump area era there's been kind of um a a flourishing of um you know left wing or hyper partisan liberal um you know facebook pages or yep. whatever but the 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 reach that they have and and i think that they you know there there's danger to that too but it's so much smaller that, you know, on the right, it's so much further along to the point where they basically elected a president from this world. On the left, it's kind of just getting started. I think it's something to keep an eye on there. But the, the, the reach is so much bigger on the right than anything that does the kind of same stuff on the left. I will say uh, in 2005, uh, I think it was uh, Joshua Green writing in The Atlantic. I remember this piece because it stuck out for me was was issuing this warning to the left be very careful about um, mm-hmm. about air america because they could grow <laughs> into i i mean that that was my response at the time too but this is this is why i think like it, there is something fundamental about the left that cannot be like there can't it cannot be analogous to what the right does because at the time they were like you got to be careful because you don't want this to get uh you know get away from them like uh, rush limbaugh now this is 10 years ago right um, right, right you know right. before the thousand losses across the country before uh rush limbaugh spawned in many respects you know uh donald trump He's a radio. Uh, his talking points come from radio as much as Fox News. Now I think yeah. he's sitting in an office more. But uh, um, and the idea was like you know be concerned about this. I agree. There's stuff definitely stuff happening on the left, but it will not ever, ever, ever get the funding that we see on the right. It it it, it just it will not happen. It did not happen even remotely close to the radio in, in radio. Which is, <laughs> well, I was going to say, you've, you've been on the front lines of this, right? So, you yeah, know, the money you, you all know came, about the economics here. The money all came from basically, 
you know, what we would call in the, uh, you know, the independent film business dentist money, where there was no, hmm. where it was just like, you know, uh, one guy's like, hey, I want to be, I'm from Silicon Valley. I want to, I want to go to uh, Ariana Huffington's parties. I'm going to give money to right. this <laughs> with no concept of what they were doing. And, and then there was a series of owners like that. There were, there were five owners in five years. And yeah, so there yeah. was no... Whereas on the right, they're much more sophisticated and it comes from like billionaires. Right? Exactly. It's um, venture capital yeah. style. And it's like, here's the money. I'm going to, I'm going to seed a thousand, uh, you know, uh, flowers and the one that, uh, the, the top 10 that bloom the tallest, you're going to get more money and that's it. And that's the way it works. And there's nothing analogous to that on the left. Nothing. I, mean, I think that's basically right. But I, I will, I will echo my, uh, Josh Green, for, uh, formerly of the Atlantic. Um, the only thing I will say is that I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say it to completely be lulled into a false sense of security. I think that people on the left should be careful, right? Just be, just keep an eye out for the spreading of, you know, liberal conspiracy theories. Or, oh, no, or no, no, no. I agree with that. Right? Believe me, I spend half my time doing that. But I'm just telling you that <laughs> the, to the extent that they're funded, right? Like, yeah, th- no, it's, right. it is not coming. It is, it is completely organic. The money is not coming. The number, the only sort of like left version of that that has received outside funding would be the Young Turks. And their major uh, investment up until uh, about three months ago was from a former Republican governor. (laughs) (laughs) It was from Buddy Romer. And then, and, right. and okay. now the money is just coming from uh, media. There's no, there's no politics behind that. Uh, there's no, mm-hmm. you know, there's no one out there who's like, you know, they may give, uh, they may, you know, lean left and give uh, money to Democrats, but for them, it's not a political project at all. Uh, whereas, you know, when, um, when, uh, you know, uh, Coke funded uh, think tanks give money to uh, these outfits, it's not like I'm doing this for the entertainment value of uh, the, the the what are the Lost Boys or whatever they call themselves. Um, uh, I mean, so but yeah. Uh, but yes, I agree that there's there's problem. But but the funding mechanism, because what happens if we do enter that world? And I, and I think to a certain extent we're there because. You write, it's easier uh, than ever for news consumers to ensconce themselves in hermetically sealed information bubbles and ignore revelations uh, that challenge their worldviews. I am quite convinced that we have now entered into that, um, entered into that, that era that for an enormous amount of the country, they, they get in their car, they have no option but to listen to right wing uh, talk radio they get to their work. Maybe they go get a haircut. Fox News is playing at the barbershop. Fox News has far more clearance, particularly in large swaths of the country. Um, they go home. They watch their 6 o'clock news. It's a Sinclair Media uh, news station. They have no idea they're getting any type of bias. And then they turn on Fox. And when Donald Trump says something that we all think is insane, um, or if he even walks back something, that just gives them the option of which one of those takes they're going to use for the narrative they're constructing. And it is a completely different yep. reality than what the rest of us are living in, uh, even under the auspices of like, you know, what you and I would agree is sort of some form of like neutral journalism as much. Maybe we have an issue with this or we have an issue with that, but that there's actually some type of journalistic integrity to it. I think there's vast swaths of the country that are living exclusively in a conservative bubble and don't even have the opportunity. It's not even self-selected. Like I might go watch MSNBC and listen to Sam Cedar's podcast or, you know, uh, the radio show or something. But uh, you have to make an effort to do that. In large swaths of the country, I don't even think they realize they're making an effort to do that. They're ju- it's just like, oh, that's news. Well, I think that's true. I, the, the, I write about how one of the the fears that I have in this this era is the the way that news has ceased to function as a means of act of information and enlightenment and instead has just become fodder for you know political debates that play out endlessly on Twitter and Facebook like it, basically I think that people are you're right 
in, in, ensconced in these hermetically sealed bubbles. I would argue that it happens on the left as well, but we don't have to argue about this that much. But there are people who 98% of their media consumption is just validating what they, they already believe. And then, and, and increasingly what I think is interesting is the way, it, the, the, the battlefields where right and left clash are, are, are kind of, you know, your aunt's Facebook feed, right? Your, your Facebook page. And that's where you see this kind of laid bare where people are just parroting talking points from, uh, you know, Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson or whatever. And, and they don't even realize in a lot of cases that they're making controversial claims here. They're just, they're just saying right. what they've heard. Uh, constantly every single day on Fox News or on talk radio and just assume that this is kind of what everyone believes, that this is the, the, that these are the facts. And this is my fear that I, I talk about, you know, our country, the, the whole idea of the marketplace of ideas only works if reality is uh, the right, it serves as the regulating force. There has to be a broadly agreed upon set of facts that everyone's starting from, and I don't think that that's happening. Well, yes, I guess, I guess what I'm arguing is that there's another thing that can screw up the marketplace of ideas, and that is if there is a player that is much larger than other players. I mean, so let's, let's envision what goes forward, because, you, I mean, your piece is about, like, you know, what will this look like? And what I'm suggesting mm -hmm. is that, and I agree with you, there's, like I say, uh, there are, you can be in a left wing media bubble. And, but I think, um, uh, you know, largely you're not necessarily aware of that. But, um, uh, but, but the size of those bubbles are just so, so dramatically smaller that. Right. What we perceive as a fundamental shift in the way that conservative media views journalism is really, in my mind, a function of scale. That mm -hmm. the only thing that's changed between now and 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, is that it's grown. It's grown to the point where it has, you know, like, I mean, I wrote a book about this in 2006, that the, the margins of the Republican Party were now moving to the center. And we are now 10 years later. And I think that's like, you know, indisputably the case. Right. I mean, yeah. where where yeah. where Pat Toomey, who was the the crazy guy who was primarying Arlen Specter, is now like he's <laughs> part of the genteel, you know, part of the Republican. Party. Yeah, right, right. And. I do think that the, uh, you know, the, the left has moved to the left, but in terms of its apparatus, it, the, the one on the right is so outsized that it produced a president. <laughs> and, right. uh, and that uh, if we enter into this era that you're talking about, the dynamics on the money is not going to change. You may have a well, bunch I, of, I mean, I, 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 so the, I, I think you're right to a point, but I, I, I want to, would reserve final judgment until we're a little further into the Trump presidency. Because one thing I will say is that what, what was amazing for this conservative media complex, the, 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 the kind of factor that drove its growth more than anything was probably the Obama presidency, that they had a villain to go after every day, right? And so a lot of money uh, flowed into the conservative media over the past eight years, 10 years. I, I do wonder if, you know, the New York Times had a piece about all the money that's going into fund the quote unquote resistance, all the different liberal groups. It would I be wonder anemic. if at some point. I mean, well, like, right. So even I, indivisible I could some, barely get point, money. Even indivisible. Uh, well, but but I, I, I do wonder if at some point, the, you know, somebody comes up with a good pitch for like, we need a hundred million dollars for a serious you know, resistance news network. And, and yeah. if they don't get that funding, I'm just, I, I got to tell you, like uh, uh, I s sat in this office and I said in November, I said, listen, within three or four months, um, we, we, we will probably hear from people about building something and no, there's nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's really that's, interesting. It, I mean, there's nothing. Um, and it's not like this is that big of a world, right? Like, right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm aware. You would of, know if it was. I would, I'm yeah. aware of everybody who's who does this right. uh, for a living, and 
Um, you know, maybe there's some secret thing that's going on out there, but I don't think so. I mean, this is, <laughs> you would think, right? I mean, you would think, but, um, and, you know, when you look at the proliferation of not just obviously Fox News uh, and, and Breitbart's and uh, what's happening with like YouTube and, um, but also when you start to think of like these, these other like, I don't know, World Net Daily Network. There's like three or four of those things yeah. that are growing. Yeah. And uh, Newsmax. Newsmax. Really big. Yeah. I mean, it really is uh, stunning. And it and and I'm quite convinced. Like, there's nowhere in the country where you could go and get. Well, I just, I mean, there's no left wing radio. There's, I guess, there's MSNBC for your your left wing television, but we're really only talking about three or four uh, programs at night, right? I mean, um, mm -hmm. the rest are dominated by business uh, journalists and former Republicans. I mean, half of the network <laughs> is former Republicans. Uh, you know, I, I, when, right. you, even if I watch Chris Hayes tonight, I can tell you that uh, <laughs> if I'm not on, it's going to be Jennifer Rubin or, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, people who, I mean, so... You know, there is no there's there's and and and, and I rail against uh, the the conspiracy uh, minded folks on the left. But um, that's just because we're fighting over, you know, scraps. And it's important right. at this stage, you know, it, you can lose 10 percent mm. if you've got a big chunk of, of what's going on. But uh, I, it's just I, I worry. Not only do I worry that we're headed into an era where. Uh, something like the New York Times or even CNN, you know, I mean, I'm looking at a picture of like the most important story of the day is that Hillary Clinton hasn't said anything about Harvey Weinstein until day five. Right, like, right, I just, right. I, I'm not convinced of that. But um, but even I, I worry about the loss of 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 that reportage, um, because then I can, you know, uh, I, I, I if that goes away, the vacuum is not going to be filled by yeah you know left wing fox it's just not going to Well so this is this is my pitch when I you know I've been talking about this piece this is the pitch that I make to audiences on the left and the right but especially the the left cuz I know that you, you know your listeners and a lot of a lot of people are worried about this this trend that I've documented in this piece and my pitch is if you want to fight that you don't just you know support more liberal media or left-wing media. I mean, do that if you feel like it's important, obviously. But also, you know, subscribe to the Washington Post, the New York Times. Subscribe oh, to your they, local newspaper. They the already Daily. do. Like, I can, I can yeah, assure well, I, I you. Just, oh, I'm just saying yeah. that, that's what the, the best thing, I think, for, uh, for the left and people on the right who are, who are operating in good faith is for there to be a robust press that is – nonpartisan at just contributing facts and context and information to the di the the conversation for then you guys to to take and do with it what you will but what happens what's the next step like i mean we're watching these outlets uh start to uh diminish in in reach and and, and power what what happens next because like <laughs> yeah this has been this has been, I mean, this has been what the, you know, center to the left has always said, right? And mm -hmm. um, it's not working. Well, my, my, so one thing that I think could start happening, maybe five years down the line, maybe sooner, is that some of these, uh, you know, objective, neutral, nonpartisan news outlets are going to have their backs up against the wall. They're being very dire financial straits and are, are going to decide that they need to pivot and become more ideological, that they need to identify the core market audience niche that they're, they're targeting and then just start, you know, producing content for them. I think some of them will become more liberal. Some of them will probably become more conservative. Some of them will, you know, maybe drop news altogether and just cover, uh, you know, you know, right. celebrity stuff or whatever. But I think that that that's my fear is that I'm not talking about the New York times necessarily, though. I think that, that it could happen there, but in, you know, a lot of these kind of mid tier uh, news outlets are going to reimagine themselves as 
uh, ideological media companies because they think that that's the way to go. I'm not actually convinced that will save them, but I think that I can see that kind of a misguided calculus being done by a lot of media executives. Interesting. Well, I guess uh, I guess we'll 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 see. Um, God bless us all. Uh, <laughs> McKay, thank you so much for your time today. I really peace, appreciate it. We will put a link at Majority FM uh, to your piece in the uh, Columbia Journalism Review. Okay, thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks I appreciate lot. it. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks. Interesting. And I think he, he came, I think he was one of those, like, more conservative. I don't know if he's actually conservative, but I think, like, he went in. I mean, he's always been a very good journalist. He had a lot of sources for, like, Paul Ryan and stuff in the lead up. He had a book leading into 2016 campaign about a lot of the main Republicans. Right. Um, I don't know, man. I get I get more and more nervous about this every day. Like I'm quite convinced that there you would not be hard to run into a lot of people out uh, in, you know, your neck of the woods, Michael, and Mac, Michael, Matt, Jesus, it's too many people in here. I can't even. Uh, <laughs> did you do the yawn thing? Oh my God! I wish that was on camera. That was awesome. That just completely slammed Michael. Just impersonated the totally. impersonator. That was great. <laughs> um, in your neck of the woods, I wonder. I wonder. I, I do think that you just walk into people just a complete bubble now. I think uh, I listened to uh, Minneapolis radio, KFA, and it was a sports station, but they had a lot of Minnesota liberals in, and I listened to that like all the time and even taped it. And I think that like that that media connection was big for me. Right. Like, as a high schooler. That's how you get, ended up here. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. I mean, does anybody remember uh, Indy Mike, who we would have on? Were you not here when we had... Oh, my gosh. So Indy Mike is the guy I would get in email fights with all the time. And he was one of those guys, like, I listened to all sides. I listened to... Um, I listened to, to Bill Hemmer and to Ann Coulter. And... Um, he was like, there are no facts. That is what they've been learning on the on the on the right for long. There are no facts, and um, it's a bit of a problem. Well, facts aren't fun. They're just no facts, and they're not it's just pleasant like your opinions. Like if you're on that side of things, facts suck. I I just ignore them too. Jamie, are you well, you you look like you're about you're like. You want to talk about facts? I mean, do you really want to know my opinion? <laughs> of course. Why? You think there are facts? You think there are no facts? I mean, getting mad at the ruling class for controlling the media is like getting mad at a cat for being an asshole. Like, if you don't want an asshole cat, maybe don't have a cat. Well, all right. Fair enough. I mean, I guess um, it's not a question of... It, in this instance, I mean, it's not a question of being mad at the the ruling class for controlling media, it's uh, concern <laughs> about, about where uh, the media is headed. I mean, it is being so weaponized, but I, but I get your point. I mean, but what, how does that happen if the media is controlled by the ruling class? How does it happen? Like what you just described, like the people with all of the money are propping up these weaponized what, outlets. How do you get rid of the cat? in your scenario get rid of capitalism mm -hmm. and and how do you do that without any access to the media mm, difficult not impossible all right well maybe folks will have to tune into the fun hat patreon.com slash the majority <laughs> that's how you do that uh we shall see i mean it's possible um i mean i kind of think that the right is doing this because they know that they have to in a way that the left doesn't. I mean, I mean, I don't think that, that there's any money for this on the left anywhere. I can't imagine where who would fund this sort of projects. I mean, maybe George Clooney is a leftist underneath it or something. But yeah, but he doesn't have that kind of money. Yeah, exactly. So it's just not going to happen. You don't become a billionaire and are okay with some type of populist medium. But if it everything was happen. equal, they know they would lose. So they know they need to invest this kind of cash. Yes, I think that's true. I definitely think that's true. Um and they're doing it, and then you get stuff like, I mean, look, I think you could, there's a big difference between a uh, FCC chair who says, 
um, we're going to maintain 30% clearance rules across the country versus 70% under some type of UHF thing. And that Sinclair media is going to make a big difference. I think there's a big difference between a, uh, a Bill Clinton who's, who, who signs the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and under Kennedy, who had an FCC chair who said this is a vast wasteland. Um, I think that that fundamentally implicates our media. You know, getting rid of the, the, the fairness doctrine fundamentally implicates our media. I mean, so there isn't, it's not just, you know, in my mind anyways, you got to get the cat out of the house necessarily. You can do certain things like, hey, you know, you can't go in this room. Or um, uh, I'm not going to put the good furniture in with the room. Or, you know, maybe we'll file your claws down. Is that what people do with cats? Don't they do that declaw cats? I'm not saying I'm. I don't do that. I don't want to get into like an animal cruelty thing here. I'm just saying theoretically there are other things you could do. You put in cat, cat gloves. It doesn't work on cats, and it doesn't work on the ruling class. I may have to get a different uh, sound effect. You know what's sad? Uh, So Kim Phillips Fine, who we had on for for that uh, Fear City, I think it was called. She also did a book called Invisible Hands about sort of the uh, early right wing and like DuPont against FDR type of thing. And the sad thing is is FDR, they had all these uh, sort of groups and front groups like like what we now see as American Enterprise Institute. And FDR had everybody wise to it and people would laugh at these groups. And like, I don't know if we can somehow reach a point where we don't trust this bullshit anymore and more and more, less and less people trust it. Like, I'm, I'm not sure how, I think that's what needs to happen though. One of, um, the, one of the uh, complaints that was certainly out there at the time, and you know, you hear some people talking about it, is that um, Obama's project was more focused on policy. I mean, put aside what uh, people presume about uh, Obama's uh, politics for a moment, that the, the decision to push policy over politics upon getting into office uh, was, a, was one that is, uh, has been very um, uh, difficult for the left, I think. Uh, which is not to say that Obama's politics are... Um, uh, you know, anything more than, you know, sort of like maybe center left. But the idea that, you know, he had said, I, I want to be like Ronald Reagan, or he had said that I admired Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan, um, as much as uh, the policy damage he did, it was more he did the damage of, you know, spawning really much of what we see now because of just rhetoric and uh, disposition. So... <sighs> I'm going to take a nap. Instead, we're going to go into the fun half, folks. 646-257-3920 is the number. Just a reminder, um, your membership makes this show possible. Uh, in between arguing with George Soros, when I tell him to stop giving us so much money, I don't want him. Here's the dilemma, folks. I don't want Soros to feel like he controls this. So you have to kick up. Um, No, our members um, provide us 96.3% of our revenue. Uh, So if you have the financial means, become a member today. And as a thank you, we give you uh, more um, more, uh, material and um, commercial free on days. And we have commercials. Uh, It's commercial free for you. And uh, we're going to up our website soon. We have a free app. All of these things, folks. And don't forget, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use you coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And if you're buying your crap from Amazon, the least you can do is buy it through our link at MajorityReportKickback.com. We got a jet link uh, there as well. And if you uh, feel like you have not gotten your fill of uh, Michael because he's taken one of his flash vacations again, just sort of ups and go like, oh yeah, I met. Did I mention that to you? You were here that day, right? Yeah, I've I've, I've been here for a couple of those days. Oh, I didn't I didn't mention to you that I was taking eight days off in the first three weeks of October. 
Uh, but if you miss them, uh, you can go and check out uh, last night's uh, The Michael Brooks Show, which you can sign up for on uh, iTunes or uh, see on our YouTube channel. All right, 646-257-3920. We got a new one. Which one is this? Oh, the ska version. All right. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report, folks. You know the I am. What? When is AOL stop, stopping to do that? You I got to get the app, folks. I don't know what to tell you. You got to get the app. Got to get the app. Uh, maybe we'll figure out some uh, thing to put on the um, uh, on the website. I love Sarah Palin. Terrible interview. Dude is totally out of touch. Details don't penetrate the right-wing bubble. As long as the big-picture narrative makes sense to them, the details don't have to matter. Marsha Blackburn just did an ad yesterday talking about how she stopped the sale of baby body parts. Yeah, let's play that. Twitter this is inter uh, interesting. Well, we'll get to that in a second. The baby body parts lie is already over a year old anyway. The right-wing is much more inclined toward religion and a central tenet. Religion is faith. The idea of faith is inherently a rejection of facts and details. We can't reach out to them. Uh, for help to make America better and our institutions more legitimate because to them that ends with them in power all over us. Our candidates only need to win by one vote. I, I agree with that. And I was actually uh, intrigued at the notion that maybe as the value of supporting these journalistic enterprise at this point uh, might very well be that um, if, they're, if you're in the majority of their customer base that when we get to that point where they contract and they just go towards their customers, they, 
uh, I was very intrigued by that as a strategy. Yeah, I don't think who that are you going to pick? Uh, yeah, exactly. I don't think that was his his agenda. But uh, this I am or brings up this Marsha Blackburn ad. She is running in Tennessee, right, for Senate, and this is the ad that Twitter took down because it was too provocative, I guess, or something. Uh, and maybe Twitter doesn't have a policy of like too full of crap that we can't maintain it. But here is Marsha Blackburn uh, running on uh, like this I am or says a lie that won't die. Here she is. The United States Senate. It's totally dysfunctional and it's enough to drive you nuts. And that's why I've decided to do something about it. I'm Marsha Blackburn. I'm a hardcore card-carrying Tennessee conservative. I'm politically incorrect and proud of it. So let me just say it like it is. The fact that our Republican majority in the U.S. Senate can't overturn Obamacare or will not overturn Obamacare, it's a disgrace. Too many Senate Republicans act like Democrats or worse. And that's what we have to Pause change. it. Hold on one second. What's what's worse? What could be worse? Like a super Democrat, maybe. Like a like an Uber Democrat. All right, continue. To change. Here in Tennessee, I fought my own party to stop a massive job killing state income tax and we stopped it. We won. I know the left calls me a wing nut or a knuckle dragging conservative and you know what I say that's all right bring it on I'm 100 <laughs> percent pro-life I fought Planned Parenthood and we stopped the sale of baby body parts thank God I shoot ski pause it um it was super easy to stop the sale of uh, baby body parts because it was never it never happened um I stopped the black market for like gray alien kidneys. That's uh, Matt actually did do that, and that was impressive. There have been not a single uh, black market sale of alien gray kidneys. What is it? Gray alien? What is it? I just wanted to specify they're from outer space. Gray outer space, alien, yeah. right? Of course. Um, I single-handedly uh, stopped the invention of the thing that levitated buildings. Never heard of it, right? Never existed. Eh, I don't like to brag about it too much. Go ahead. I shoot skeet, have a concealed carry permit for the gun that I do pack in my purse. I believe our government spends too much, grows too much, and is bankrupting our children's future. I believe in President Trump's immigration ban, and I'll fight with him every step of the way to build that wall. I stand for hundreds of millions of honest Americans who work hard and they play by the rules. And I stand for the greatest country the world has ever known. I stand when the president walks in the room and yes, I stand when I hear the Star Spangled Banner. A great Tennessean who wasn't so politically correct himself once said, one man with courage makes a majority. Well, courage comes in both genders, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate because mm. I'll fight every day to make our Republican majority act like one. Too much is at stake. America needs a conservative revolution and leaders who are willing to fight in it. I'm Marsha Blackburn. That's why I'm running for the U.S. Senate, and I would be honored to have your vote. Mm, I like the music. Do you want to guess who that quote was by? Uh, One man see. with courage makes a majority. Mm. Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. She fucking rules. She is the best. Oh, if there were Democrats who talked like that, I would probably still be a Democrat. Real there talk. Go. There you go. Well, uh, 
I like the fact that she pushed um, some form of gender equality alongside with, um, you know, uh, quoting a, a somebody guy should who primary a against her as a SJW <laughs> for that line. That's right. Like, how dare you? Courage dare is you, only courage? on one side. Oh my God. Um, uh, yeah, there you have it. Um, it's the uh, the culture war is back, folks. The culture war is back. Jonathan Armistead, two quick points. Can Uchi Wally get a show far for his birthday? Sure, of course. Happy birthday, Uchi Wally. Love your discussions on how unfeasible concert goers shooting back in Las Vegas would have been. A great documentary on the subject is Tower on the University of Texas Tower shooting in 1966. People who went out to shoot the sniper themselves caused problems and almost killed policemen trying to apprehend the subject. Teacher BB. Hey, guys, I share Sam's concern about where we're headed. I truly think we face a choice between mindfulness and some variant of fascism. Mindfulness promotes compassion, discourages materialism. Fascism promotes violence, division, and hypercapitalism. May seem soft, but along with dirty political work, we need to promote mindfulness in schools and throughout society. What do you think? Uh, yeah, it can't hurt. <laughs> Dirk. Uh, if we revise the Judiciary Act of 1869, we're not stuck with a conservative SCOTUS majority. You know this, yes? Um, I think it is very likely that in the event that we have one or two more Donald Trump picks, that we will have um, more than nine justices uh, in 10 years. I think that's very possible. Epish. Maybe maybe 15 years. It might take a couple of like serious uh, rulings f uh, before there is sort of a, a will. Liberal conspiracy theories is the class struggle, a Marxist conspiracy theory, because if like Pearlstein, I listened to Henry Farrell's Vox article with Stephen Tellis, who works with uh, Tyler Cowen at Libertarian Nickerson Center. McLean's Democracy in Chains was a li liberal conspiracy theory. I'll probably get called a conspiracy theorist for bringing up the fact that Cowan and Tellis are at Nikeson. Trust me, Sam, the second you bring a left message to a mainstream platform like Democracy and Chains getting on the Oprah Book Club, uh, guys like Pearlstein will immediately start calling you a conspiracy theorist. I, you know, look. There, there were connections that McLean made in that book that were, I don't know if you could say circumstantial or, or whatnot. Um, and a lot of these uh, scholars are, you know, m a little bit more rigorous. I, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I need to read their their piece. I, I I mean I know what you're talking about. I mean Henry Farrell is a pretty um, uh, I think legit writer, and Tellus I think is also you know at the very least um, not disingenuous, and certainly Pearlstein is not. But um, uh, I enjoyed the conversation though. I don't know if I'm a socialist though. I certainly know that capitalism is the enemy. But most importantly, I know that social liberals are not the left's greatest threat. Fascism is. Yes, no, I agree with that. Uh, Self-described liberals who kiss up to Evan McMullen and Charlie Sykes ought to understand the right is the greatest threat too, not the left. I agree with that as well. Uh, capitalism will continue to hide behind social liberalism. I agree with that. No way, dude. No what? Yeah, like the way uh, Ivanka basically, like she tried to roll out like her personality or brand and it was basically just Hillary's campaign. Do you remember that? It was after the election. I can't remember the video. There was some video, and it was like it was very obvious that she was trying to take that ground as well. Well, yeah, she was also trying to maintain her brand, I guess, for any type of spinoff from the election. But good luck with that. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> didn't work out so well for her. All right, let's play this video. Um, you know, sadly, the. And, and, and to be honest, I haven't watched that much of uh, of the news as of late. And by the, as of late, I mean like in the last 36 hours. Um, but largely, the story of Puerto Rico is off the front pages and off uh, the lead stories of the news. And the thing is, it's going to get 
even worse now because you still have a million people without clean uh, drinking water. You still have 75% of the island without electricity, maybe more. And you're going to hear problems like this, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse, I think, I'm afraid. Here is um, a, uh, and, and, and good for at least CBS, we're having a reporter down there. And this guy, David uh, Bergnod, I think has been pretty good, actually. Um, he's with the uh, Puerto Rican governor, Ricardo Rosello, and they are talking about what I think is going to be a nascent, which is a nascent problem, but I think it's going to be huge. I don't know if it's going to come from this particular bacteria, but it's going to be huge. The governor is updating us on the death toll. It has gone from 43 to 45. The two most, most recent deaths are believed to be from a bacterial infection known as leptospirosis. What, what do you know, Governor? Well, uh, we we just got information as we were doing our, our tour that uh, there were two deaths um, from, uh, from Bayamon. Uh, they are taken to the forensic center right now to analyze, but based on the clinical uh, framework, uh, they believe uh, to be from the bacteria. Um, how do you believe these people control? Contracted it. Well, again, it's it's typically contracted by uh, some contact with uh, urine from uh, rodents or, or animals that have the bacteria, uh, and it spreads that way. Whether it be through you know eye sockets or or uh, you know uh, drinking water or something to that effect. So th this, I mean, Antissa, it's not hard to imagine. And I think he goes on to say there were five more cases uh, that were confirmed with people with the disease, but um, they're getting treatment. But I, I don't, you know, I don't know how much treatment they're going to be able to give as these things start to happen. When you're living in um, uh, these circumstances where there's no hygiene going on because you're still just climbing out of like this disaster. Uh, yesterday we played that video of those, um, I guess, dozen vets who are over there trying to help with the relief services. And they're saying there's just no supplies are getting up into the western part of the country. And meanwhile, Mark Zuckerberg has apologized for the, uh, I don't know what I would call it, stunt. They live streamed a virtual trip, a virtual trip to Puerto Rico by using 360 degree video from NPR, which, you know, that showed behind them a, a flooded streets. And apparently Facebook Spaces app lets you create a 3D avatar. Uh, I, I, you know, I remember when the, there was virtual life or second life or whatever it was. And it was, you know, fine. <laughs> but this was grotesque. He has apologized. Here is a picture of Mark and his co-host, Rachel, high-fiving each other. Apparently not subject to uh, rodent feces. Uh, in, in virtual life. Here is his uh, apology. And um, it's clear that he doesn't get it. My goal here was to show how virtual reality can raise awareness and help us see what's happening in different parts of the world. I want you to contemplate something. The guy is apologizing and saying, my point was to exploit the horror and the tragedy of what's going on in Puerto Rico to promote this technology, which I also have an app for. But then he goes on to say, to be fair, I also want to share the news of our partnership with the Red Cross to help with the recovery. Reading some of the comments, I realized this wasn't clear. And I'm sorry to anyone this offended. The guy, the guy controls the most used social media tool in the country. 
And he wants us to believe that he has no other means in which to promote the partnership with Red Cross. I mean, put aside the idea of partnering with the Red Cross, which is sort of perfect. But he doesn't, he doesn't even get in his apology. It's just uh, amazing. But it was, in their words, a magical tour of Puerto Rico. You know what was amazing? We toured Puerto Rico. We didn't get any rat feces in our eyes. Do you think he's setting himself up to do something political here, or is he trying to? Oh, I think he is definitely toying with the idea of running. I, I suspect... There is no doubt in my mind. I suspect that either he's thinking he's running or he understands the way history is going to go with how much power they've given him over like something like a uh, communications network. And he, he's going to need to be set up politically for whatever fight is coming there. That's that could be it, too. I think it's you know, I think in this situation, you're just like, there's no opportunity cost for me to do this. There's no opportunity cost. I mean, the amount that he's getting smacked down and clowned on every time he tries to do anything is kind of restoring my faith in liberals and people in general. Yes. No, it's it's definitely helpful because he would run as a Democrat. But again, you know, there's just like huge swaths of, you know, it's. There's huge swaths of people who don't get their politics from Twitter. And Facebook. And it's very easy to sort of like make an assessment based upon what we see on social media and be way off. Um, I noticed the likes on this video way outnumbered the angry faces, for instance. I also bet that they have a mechanism in which to uh, possibly, juice yeah. that. Show it to the people who have been liking our I mean, honestly, like just I want you to just think of the people who are doing this live stream and they're looking at each other and going like, we're going to want to get a lot of likes on this, right? Yeah. We're all re going to regret this someday when he uses Facebook to become president for life. No kidding. <laughs> I already re regret uh, Facebook. Zuckerberg Cuban. It, Zuckerberg is great. Zuckerberg I was just kidding before. Joy. <laughs> George and so I witnessed a murder last night. BBC's night uh, news nights. Emily Matalas buried Secretary of State Damien Green 10 feet deep in a debate about institutional racism and the disproportionate impact of his government's austerity agenda on people of color. It was effing glorious. Here's a link uh, if you want to check it out. I will. Um, I will check it out uh, afterwards. Thank you. Uh, so Harvey Weinstein, apparently now there's been more of the, the New Yorker story, which I have not read. I read the New York Times story where, uh, a bunch of, uh, former actors and current actors, um, accused Weinstein of basically the same stuff that he had been accused of in the initial New York Times piece, his wife has left him there. And the New Yorker piece that uh, Ronan Farrow wrote apparently uh, included charges of sexual assault and rape. Here is Ronan Farrow on. On Maddow last night. And um, he he basically apparently had this story for NBC, I don't know, about six months ago or so. And listen to his response. He obviously is being a little bit careful with his words here, but listen to his response as to whether or not he found the NBC reaction to his piece that it was not ready to be legit. So, Ronan, you just said that one of these women spoke on camera back in January. You... Why did you end up reporting this story for The New Yorker and not for NBC News? Look, you would have to ask NBC and NBC executives about the details of that story. I'm not going to comment on any news organization's story that they, um, you know, did or didn't run. Uh, I will say that over many years, 
Many news organizations have circled this story and faced a great deal of pressure in doing so. Hmm. And there are now reports emerging publicly about the kinds of pressure that news organizations face in this. Mm -hmm. um, and that is real. In, in the course of this reporting, I was threatened with a lawsuit personally by Mr. Weinstein. And, um, you know, we've already seen that the Times has been publicly threatened with a suit. I don't want to describe uh, any suits leveled at other organizations that I work with. but. Uh, you know, certainly and this is a, a considerable amount of pressure that outlets get us. And well. NBC says that, you know, you didn't, that the, the story wasn't publishable, that it wasn't ready to go by the time that you brought it to them. But obviously it's ready to go by the time you got it into The New Yorker. Uh, I walked into the door at The New Yorker with a, uh, an explosively reportable piece that should have been public earlier. And uh, immediately, obviously, The New Yorker recognized that. And it is not accurate to say that it was not reportable. In fact, there were multiple determinations that it was reportable at NBC. There you go. Uh, good thing we're never going to have a problem with, threat with lawsuits threatening uh, news organizations uh, in any way. I, I meant to uh, bring that up in the interview with McKay, the idea of hmm, those billionaires. They want to sue uh, an entity out of existence. I don't think there's anything. I think the only thing that's inhibiting them from doing it right now, literally all of them, is that there are other billionaires that own them. <laughs> and... Um, They just don't want it to be awkward at the country club or Davos. I don't know. Exactly. Nobody gave a shit when it happened to Gawker because, like, everybody hates Gawker, but it was never going to stop with that. No, of course not. Of course not. And I don't know that nobody gave a shit. I mean, but, but most people did not. That's true. Established media, Established media did not care. No, because they thought that they were outside of that reach. We'll see about that. Um, all right, let's go to the phones. You're calling from a 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, hello, Sam. I think I got my speakerphone on. I'm just going to shut it off real quick. Stand okay, up. great talking to you. Yeah, Dave from Las Vegas. I've been working on a... a Alex Bones bit, having some problems in the testing lab, but I've actually got something more interesting to talk about, if okay. you don't mind. Sure. Um, yeah, it's this whole idea of uh, um, religion and belief that you've been um, delving into as of late. I'm going to throw in some uh, terms real quick. Um, theory of mind, identity and predictability. So on on the right, it seems that there's a, a belief um, or a, a rationale that power is their end. Somehow on the left, our, our belief is that there's, there's more to find out, but some things are settled. Um, and and I, I think possibly the uneducated nature of, of you know, a lot of the people on the right doesn't allow them to, to see themselves as anything other than part of the group that they're in. Whereas on the left, we can see ourselves as, as you know, more than one thing. You know, I, I, I try to be a good person, but as a member of a modern technological society, I, I, I have an impact, you know, on my great-grandchildren somehow or another, if, if I have any. But anyway, so there's this idea that, you know, we have more to figure out, and I'm losing my train of thought. I apologize. Do you have a question about anything I've talked about? Uh, no. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I, 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 I get what you're saying. I think, you know, to a certain extent, um, it is, uh, there's, there's a lot of different things going on. I think one is you have a sort of a classic rural urban divide. Uh, I think you have a society where, um, the, the fact is, is that white men are losing something. They're losing the privilege, the position they've had, uh, in society for, 
uh, a long, long time. Uh, they're not losing it probably at the rate that some of us would would want, but uh, they are losing it. They're losing it in uh, the the culture. They're losing it in um, some places in the marketplace. Not again, not as much as one would like to see. Uh, but and I think there's a certain amount of aggrievement, and I think there is a, um, a movement and a tradition in this country of of uh, playing on that aggrievement. It's not just this country, I and mean, we see it uh, a yes, lot of the, other the places. the playing on the aggrievement, the, the cynicism, and, and that's where we can point to the, the leaders of the right and, and say that this is you know, fully incorrect. I mean, just borderline evil. Yeah. Uh, to, to play with, uh, you know, people's brains like this. You know, I, they, I, they can't. I agree with you. They it's, can't it's separate themselves from from a from a group. So we come out and we say something fairly reasonable that isn't you know dogmatic to them, and all of a sudden we are in a fully separate group. Whereas we can see them as you know uneducated, possibly the the spawn of someone who drank too much when they were well you know, i don't pregnant. know if i would go I, w- I don't i wouldn't get that narrow with it but i appreciate the comment i mean i think there is you know clearly um i don't know that they're all you could say that all conservatives are um uh are victims of 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 alcohol fetal syndrome i think that would be probably painting with too broad a brush alan defan girl Hey, Sam, did you see the video that the Rational National did on your criticism of Jimmy Dore? Um, No, I don't know who the Rational National is. Uh, He basically says your argument for criticizing Jimmy rather than Joy Reid is bullshit. I can criticize both of them. Um, uh, I mean, I... We have far more crossover of Jimmy Dore fans than Joy Reid fans. It's just more useful. Uh, I, uh, absolutely. And frankly, um, in terms of my reach, you know, uh, the I don't have the ability to change the viewing habits of people on MSNBC who are going to tune in to. Um, I have probably more influence on uh, on YouTube. That is that's the case. Um when I criticize, like, Tucker Carlson, it's not because I want to discipline Tucker Carlson. Um, it's because I am either just mocking him because it's hilarious uh, or because I'm trying to, you know, use them as a, use their argument to show how vacuous it is. Would Joy Reid, to the extent that, like, I don't know, you know, to the extent that her, I disagree with her, I've either expressed it on TV with her, sitting next to her, or um, this whole show is centered around, uh, I mean, I don't follow her in the same way. But I can tell you this, if Joy Reid came on my show, did not know what a filibuster was, had just done a show where their partner said Peter Thiel would be fine as a Supreme Court justice. He came on and said to contemplate the idea that Mitch McConnell would get rid of the filibuster is the equivalent of being worried about the moon falling into Lake Michigan. And then said, well, I, you know, I'm a comedian. I don't know about this stuff. And then left the show, continued to argue about it on Twitter, invite me onto his show, then pretend there was too much going on in his life to actually have me come on his show, excuse me, her show, I would be talking a lot more about Joy Andrew. So I don't know who the rational national is. He sounds right wing. He sounds to me somewhat irrational and not national. He sounds to me more like the irrational local guy. I don't know. I don't know who that is. But 
Um, I think it says a lot about Jimmy Dore that people uh, named the Rational National are coming to his defense about things like this. My favorite was when (laughs) he was highlighting a tweet by Fox News attacking Democrats. And he wrote like, even Fox News is attacking Democrats. (laughs) And Matt quote tweeted it's like it. even fox yeah it's like uh fox news is like the democrats realize they have a problem uh even fox news re- oh it was even fox news recognizes the democrats have a problem with their base or something like that as if like <laughs> they don't notice when the democrats are in disarray about the things. fox fox news finally getting into the game call him from a 415 area code who's this where are you calling from uh this is uh h wash parole that's uh yeah did you hear that uh that uh, Donald Trump is uh, going to do something with NAFTA. Did you hear that? Uh, I, mean, I, I did hear that at the time, that, yes. That boy ain't right. I mean, you know, y- you can put your boots in an oven, but that don't make them biscuits. So, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, this, oh, shit. this is Paco. St- I just wanted to... Why did you stop? It was good. I just wanted to use my H. Ross Perot imitation. That was pretty good, <laughs> Spocko. Um, but what I really want to talk about was um, uh, your thing earlier today about the the media in terms of the left wing media. I totally agree with you about the funding of the left wing media and what how horrible, horrible it is, because I think some of the people still think that you have to make a profit. And I always like to remind people that the New York Post loses over a hundred million dollars every year, every year. And Murdoch just like, yeah, I just want to keep spending that. So um, until it it becomes clear to the left wing billionaires, if they ever decide to get into this, that they don't have to make money and that they have to keep spending the money and losing money, maybe forever, that and then it's okay. then maybe something would happen. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's one of the things that they and, and talking about funding, I know that you mentioned earlier about how. Air America was funded or not funded and all the various different things. And I remember there was a big thing about how Limbaugh and those people would brag about how, you know, they, they don't know how to make money. They don't understand radio because they were making money at the time. But because of the, the work that I and others have done, yep. they don't make the kinds of money anymore. And we now look at how they just, you know, don't talk about that too much. I was uh, talking with... uh, Well, Spocko, you uh, also know that they are heavily subsidized in the form of Heritage Foundation uh, money that comes in the form of either like direct ads from the Heritage Foundation or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hillsdale College uh, or, I mean, you know, Glenn Beck had major deals with the AFP. Um, they, you know, now they get, uh, you know, they make ads probably like on par with, I don't know, with Marin's podcast. Um, but right. there, there's a tremendous amount of subsidies floating around in that world. And, and then it's, it does make a difference when we, we impact their funding because then it no longer becomes, oh, we can make money from this. Like Breitbart's right now has no money, but they're still bragging about, well, we still have this reach. And so that's one of the things that uh, to be you know, contemplate. But I think the other thing about that concerns me about when we talk about media and funding that I think is one way to go forward is um, uh, my friend Wendell Potter. He and a group of people are starting a new investigative journalism thing Tar-Bell. called the Tarbell. Yeah. And I think that one of the things they might be able to do, like what ProPublica is doing, is you see them partnering with mainstream media yes. like the Washington Post, New York Times. And so that's one way to keep it so that they at least have a bigger audience. Yes. You know, so well, you know, that funded. is, that is, or I should just say, that's what Bannon did. That's what Bannon did with the Times, uh, with the Clinton cash mm-hmm. thing. And mm-hmm. I mean, the model, uh, is an interesting model where you take uh, nonprofits and piggyback them with for profits so that uh, you get the platform. The Bannon understood 
that the Times was did not have the money to go and do investigative journalism, wanted content, also was open to the idea of of, uh, you know, uh, critiquing Clinton and just provided this stuff, which turned out uh, largely to be junk. But uh, it worked. I mean, it worked quite well. But right. And this is something that, that I remember Pete Peterson did, too, for The Washington Post with his Peterson Foundation. Yep. And the debt is like, so there's a there's a problem with that uh, doing it. But when you got groups like, you know, Tarbell coming up and then ProPublica, that is is one other way to do it. Uh, um, Spock, I got to jump. I'm sorry. We got to be quick. OK, I got about right, one, one more thing. I want to talk about um, I'd like somebody to talk about the funding for the NRA and how they're funding the various different programs that they they run. Um, I had somebody that I talked to that I can talk about how much medical care costs for all these gunshots and gun gun wounds. It's two point eight billion dollars a year for wow. hospital care for gunshots. Wow. And that is a huge number that nobody talks about. And who pays for that? Well, it's the public. And that's something that we could say. I Here's interviewed a guy. Reduce. I interviewed a guy on uh, Ring of Fire Radio, an attorney, about the potential for creating a tobacco style um, uh, legal assault, essentially, on gun manufacturers. And we can't do that until <clears throat> until uh, Congress gets rid of uh, the special immunity they provide for uh, for for gun manufacturers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the only. It's the only industry in which they do anything like that. Appreciate the call. Right. Just a quick comment on Thanks. the rational national. Apparently, the connotations aren't right wing. He's from Canada. Uh, and apparently, people haven't seen any strains of the dumb dumbness in him. So just wanted to point that out. No, he may be. He may be you're right. But, uh, I, you know, like I say, I can't critique his um, argument because I haven't seen it. But uh, I mean, if he's Canadian, I think case closed. I don't even need to say anything. Call him from a 518 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is uh, Addison. Hello, Addison. Uh, What's sorry, on your mind? I think I'm getting an echo. Um, oh God, sorry. I'm getting an echo from the phone system. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, um, I'm the emailer, obviously. Um, and I just wanted to call and just have a brief discussion on that. If okay. That's okay. Yeah. I just got a couple of minutes, but let me just catch people up. Yeah. You had, super quick. you had written in, um, to, um, to, to tell me that my use of crazy in the context of Trump was, um, w w stigmatized people with mental illness. Is that fair? Yeah. And I think that the conversation, first of all, I want to say thanks. I thought you responded to that in a really ideal way. Um, and I think that the issue is I've seen people talking about the idea that like, oh, you think if Trump has sociopathy, that's not a big deal. You think that's not something to talk about. That's not something to worry about. And my problem isn't that. It's when we start talking about like that as a disqualifying measure and focus on that as a disqualifying measure, like I've seen a lot of liberals do. And I think Judy was kind of doing in particular, like we need to get him out because he's crazy. It's like, no, we need to get him out for, like, a whole slew of reasons that I'm not even going to start listing beyond, like, racism and misogyny and all that. And so when we're focusing on him being crazy as a way to kick him out rather than, like, this massive host of issues that are far more legitimate to attack him on, that's stigmatizing everybody with mental illness that's incapable of doing work. And that's what the, you know, that's what the factor about Trump is. It makes him unfit to work is his mental illness. And that's the stigmatizing part to me. Well, I mean, the thing, I mean, it's... It, it, w it's funny because the, the problems I have with it, I mean, obviously I'm not as, I, I mean, and, and I appreciate you making me more sensitive to it. The problems I have with, with making it about like the 25th Amendment and whatnot is that it completely eliminates the politics from it. And I think we're saying the same thing. I'm, yeah. I'm, my, my concerns about that are, I'm less, obviously less sensitive to, um, and, and probably less sensitive than I should be to, uh, the implications for stigmatizing people with mental illness. But I'm also concerned at the fact that, like, hey, I don't want Mike Pence in there either, and I don't care. Uh, yeah, I don't it care. It can go hand in hand, right? If we're attacking Trump as mentally ill and that's what kicks him out, then not only does that stigmatize everyone who has a mental illness and a job, it also says, like, no, 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 all the things he did are fine. If someone else comes in that's just not crazy and does the same thing, that's fine. That's what 
I mean, even if that's not I mean, what, I think that, is, what like, the liberal response is saying. In, in my defense, I mean, I think that, like, you know, last week with his trip to Puerto Rico, I just found extremely disturbing. And he did not seem to have any yeah. sense of, like, the suffering that was literally probably 20 miles from where he was. Uh, if that, yeah. I mean, and um, I found that incredibly disturbing. And the thing is, you know, Mike Pence would have gone there and he would have at the very least been conscious of it enough to pretend like he cared mm-hmm. about it. Trump didn't even seem to be conscious sure. of it enough to pretend. And that is. Yeah, but like, is that what we really want to care about? Like, well, don't you care well, more about the fact that well, this complete. Well, is, who's ruining Puerto Rico and I'll, not caring is going there. And I'll tell you why. Mike Pence would do that, too. Well, I'll tell you why. Because the lack of his ability to care or to even project that he cares makes me a little bit more concerned about something like with North Korea. Right? Because Mike Pence would not be playing this game of chicken with North Korea because at the very least, he could understand the concept of this could end quite easily. Or let me put it this way. This doesn't end except for the loss of like lives of a million people. And as horrible of a human being as I think Mike Pence is, I just don't think that he would see any, I think he would see enough downside in that to sort of like step back from the brink. Watching Trump, maybe I think you're well, maybe a bit optimistic about I, I Republican mean, response to foreign relations. <laughs> may, well, maybe I mean maybe I mean I just know that uh, you know George Bush, as horrific of a human being as he was, killing you know uh, this country killed at least a couple hundred thousand innocent civilians in Iraq, and that's a Defense Department uh, statistic. Maybe one hundred mm-hmm. seventy thousand is the Defense Department statistic. I, I just think that like. Th- th- that would be enough for Mike Pence to say, like, okay, I don't see an upside here. I'm just not going to engage. Uh, whereas Trump, I think, like, is, I, I think, I, I, I'm not convinced of that. And, and that trip to Puerto Rico really did it. So, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. Um, and, I, and I think, like, you know, I'm definitely um, uh, just dispositionally more sensitive to the idea of, like, we got to make this about politics. And I think, you know, and I appreciate your making me more sensitive to the implications of it uh, for people with, um, with, with mental illness. But, um, you know, certainly, obviously, that's not my intent. But, you know, h- how do I... Well, thank I... you for the time and for discussing it, honestly. Right. You've well, listened and you've given it in a hearing, basically. And, you know, I, that's what I wanted, and that's what's happened, and thank you. All that's right. all I really have to say on that Appreciate matter. it. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for the call. All right. Have a good All right. right, We got time for one more call and then uh, we'll do a couple of IMs. We call from a 573 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This is Ken calling from Missouri. Hello, Ken from Missouri. What is it uh, that's on your mind? Missouri. Is that (laughs) it? Sorry. You're not allowed to say that until you, unless you've been here like 10, 12 years. But well, I've watched anyway. enough outlaw Josie Wales to know. Ah, was that last dude crazy or what? I mean, seriously. Oh, that's not funny. I know, I know. I it I I thought twice about saying that, but you should have thought three times. I, I, third times, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me say this about that subject. Um, I agree with him. Uh, the labels can be uh, um, problematic. But I think in our culture, this is just my opinion, I think when people say crazy, it's sort of an analog for the dudes are mentally ill. You know, I, I think that the two have become sort of the same. You know, when you say that person's crazy, you're, you're implying the person's mentally ill. So, I don't know, I, it's just a matter of semantics, I guess. Well, I mean, I think the point is, is that um, there, there's a certain stigmatizing. I mean, if you're if you're someone who is dealing with mental illness and um, you want to be able to uh, live your life, you don't want people around you to presume uh, at work or wherever it is that you can't um, that you that you're Donald Trump like. And um, I can certainly understand that. Um I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm Donald Trump like in any. Sorry, that is my uh, daughter reminding me 
via the alarm that uh, we got to go soon. But um, yeah, I mean, so I understand the perspective, and uh, but I do think like there also has to be a mechanism for us to sort of register like a certain concern that you know um, that this guy doesn't value human life um, in such a way that he could walk into a situation and 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 perhaps you know. Just say, like, yeah, well, okay. Right. I mean, if you're telling me that only uh, South Koreans are going to die, all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that concerns yeah, me. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, right. I, I understand the connections. All right. Well, I appreciate the call. Oh, hang on. And just one last thing. Yep. I, did, um, I just want to comment on your war on the gun manufacturers. Yeah. Um, why? Maybe you could explain why that would work any better than our war on drugs. And I'll hang up. Thanks. Okay. Uh, why would that work any better on a war on drugs? Well, um, it's completely not analogous. What I'm suggesting is that you can shame the actual executives of gun manufacturers and the people who work there uh, with a concerted effort so that their family members don't like to go out in public because they're known as the people who whose dad, wife, husband, son, daughter uh, manufactures things that kill children. I think that if we had a legal drug industry in this country, I would say, I mean, uh, pharmaceuticals. Well, you pharmaceutic- shame them in a similar way, couldn't you? I mean, we actually have the ability to deal with with pharmaceuticals through tort law because they don't have the immunity that that gun manufacturers have. So I'm talking about like, you know, this is a last I don't like. I prefer to rely on uh, government regulation and then prefer to rely on on our, our laws as a way of leveraging. But. But when you don't have those options, if you were out there selling um, heroin, let's say, as a heroin, you know, chief executive of a legal heroin business and your heroin was killing how many toddlers to die a week? I don't know, five, four from guns. I don't know how many it is. Somewhere around there. Uh, if you, I, I would imagine you could do the same thing. You, you can't do the shame on war on drugs because it's not even a legal business. I mean, it's already underground. Um, and there's no, you know, I suppose we could go down and go to the, the, the cartels. and, pro, But I have a feeling that wouldn't work out too well for you. But I have a feeling that if there were uh, people camping out in front of it, I don't know the name of the CEO of uh, Remington, but if uh, people were camping out, this is a picture of the child that died today from your Remington rifle on the corner of their street. Um, things would get a little hairy in that neighborhood. I don't know why we don't see it more, to be honest with you. I really don't. You got uh, Michael Bloomberg going out there spending millions of dollars. Did you tell me they can't come up with this idea or they don't like the idea of like, using that type of influence i wonder uh all right a couple of ims that we'll get out of here calvin bw hypothetically if i work for the law firm that is representing weinstein and attempting to get him off does that make me morally culpable uh i don't think so i think you know if you work for a law firm uh, more often than not um you know that's that's your job people deserve a um a defense it's sort of what you do i think can make you start making you like skeevy uh in that capacity and i will say you know there was a um this is sort of interesting I mean, for what it's worth uh lisa bloom rightfully took a lot of uh, grief from her representing um weinstein and I say rightfully because um, she sort of built her career on 
defending women in these situations. I think. I don't know fully, but I just think it's a little bit disingenuous. And also, supposedly there was a there was a there was a book there was a movie deal, I think, involved in this, which I find to be a little bit unethical, frankly. I don't think you should be representing somebody who's, you know, you have those type of interests in because you can't really do your job properly. However, to be fair, she did quit. And a the email prankster, these are the people who, um, this guy apparently is somehow able to sort of read people's minds and send <laughs> uh, prank emails that people respond to. It's pretty impressive. He's like the David Blaine of email. The prankster emailed Lisa Bloom as Weinstein and wrote, Lisa, I've had time to think and I do understand why you felt unable to remain on my team. Bloom responded, thank you, Harvey. The new round of far more serious allegations were not made known to me, so I could not have realized, but I'm not revealing any of that publicly because that's between you and me. And then uh, the pretend Weinstein uh, coaxed Bloom into a response asking which allegations hit her hardest, and he said, uh, and she said the sexual assault. And then apparently Weinstein was uh, pranked by uh, the prankster as Anita Dunn, who was supposedly on his advising team. And the real Weinstein wrote back to her after Dunn said, uh, he said, I'm sick. I need your advice. Signed it all my best, Harvey. Uh, the prankster replied, I'm sure redemption can be found, Harvey, but only if you're willing to be as brave as those who have found the strength to stand up to you. You should accept your fate graciously and not seek to deny or discredit those who your behavior has affected. I agree, he replied. Although then he went on to say a lot of the allegations are false, as you know, <laughs> but given therapy and counseling as other people have done, I think I'd be able to get uh, be able to get there. If the industry supports me, that's all I need. Well, it turns out not so much. Sorry, buddy. But uh, I think Lisa Bloom, at the very least, comes out looking better than, you know, one might imagine in that exchange. All right. A couple more IMs, then we're out here. Bernie Sandwich. There aren't financial incentives for the wealthy to fund left-wing media. I also just think that it's not, there's not ideological. I don't think it's just a question of, of financial advantage, although I think that's part of it. I think that, like... There's not the, the, like the, the social incentive. I, I, I really do think that particularly like, I just, you know, I've talked about this in the past, but I think like liberal money, they want more of a creative expression. So they, they, they tend to fund things that are projects as opposed to operational. So it's like, I want to be able to say like, oh, my money created that as opposed to like paid for years, the ongoing uh, financing of something. Um, I want to do that wing of uh, the school or I want to do the special criminal something project or my pet project. That's just the way that I have. I you can see it, I think, in terms of like foundation grants and whatnot. Uh, but I also think there's like an allergy to sort of like the populism that comes with some of this stuff. Bernie Sandwich, you mentioned ISIS's downfall, which is not necessarily economic. Because, you know, certainly like Air America was not um, was not calling for, um, you know, uh, nationalization of uh, all the businesses. And I mean, we were, uh, you know, it ranged from like sort of standard fair Democrats to, you know, social Democrats, I would say, um, where we would talk about co-ops to a certain extent. Um, certainly redistribution, but, you know, a lot of uh, big funders are like, you need to raise the taxes. Bernie Sandwich, you mentioned ISIS downfall at the beginning of the show. Trump won't admit or declare ISIS is defeated. He needs to maintain the constant state of terror in the U.S. to retain power. Remember, it was essentially rooting against the siege of Mosul when it began. Uh, Republicans benefit from war. I don't think any of them give a shit about the implications of it. DX Fool, hi, folks, and welcome. New Kelly. Wait, what about... Uh 
What about pa- Patrick? <laughs> Who's that? Don't say hi to Brendan. That's weird. As you know, two of the are a Ring of Fire affiliates. KABQ Albuquerque and WPEK Asheville are owned by iHeartMedia, formerly Clear Channel Radio. The only progressive talkers in their portfolio. I recently have noticed these two stations aren't accessible on the iHeart app on the iPad while the right-wing talkers still are. Is that right? And it takes longer for browsers to load these stations. That's weird. It's like net neutrality is being ignored with corporations. Could you please check up on this? Uh, I will look into it. Ivanka Tinkles, you guys should look into the recent HBO Vice News on the guns of this month. They have a segment where gun manufacturers actually sponsor minors at gun shooting competitions and ask them to speak about gun regulations and policies and conventions and meetings. Wow. Rob Cully, have you watched the documentary Abacus Made by Frontline? Features Man of the Hour, D.A. Cyrus Vance, prosecuting a small family. Oh, yes. You know, I've had this conversation with somebody. I can't remember who it was that brought this up. But it was a Chinese bank. I don't know who I interviewed to talk about this. But it was a Chinese bank. And, um, like, they got, people got busted, like, $35,000 scams. Cyrus Vance did nothing else about anybody else. I, I got to, I got to check. I gotta, yeah. It was not that big of a deal. I wonder if I talked to the filmmaker. Who did I talk to about that? Chappie, I believe the right has totally abandoned the notion of democracy. Trotsky uh, would view, would have won. Jamie Rules, just curious, what kind of left ideology do you like? Well, I'm actually more of an anarcho-communist but uh, I call myself a socialist in polite company because that seems to scare people less. If she had said anarcho-communist, there might have been problems with getting her here. <laughs> Cole Addict. La Poupée has way too many cover versions for such a mediocre song. Well, maybe you need to reevaluate the idea that it's a mediocre song. Uh, Golden Toad. I don't miss Michael at all. He should do uh, too much Michael Brooks full time so we don't have to listen to his arrogant ass. Well, you know what? I'm gonna, we're going to go. I'll compromise with you. Matt, no longer uh, mic his ass. We're just going to stick just with his mouth. Uh, the first problem is thinking the Washington Post isn't problematic. It's owned by Bezos. It would be better to support things like ProPublica. Second, tomorrow my sociology professor is going to talk about Social Security. It's the same professor who thinks Dennis Miller is smart. I think he's going to say Social Security is insolvent and needs to be scaled down. Why is he wrong? Go. All right. Look, very quickly. Social Security is not insolvent. A, the trust fund lasts until um, 2034, I believe, at the last trustee report. It may be up to 2036. At that point, unless everybody on the, uh, in the country dies, except for people over the age of 65, it will fund Social Security to 78% of what it is supposed to be at this point. Social Security cannot statutorily add to the deficit. And because of wealth inequality, we capture 7% less of the country's income than we did just 30 years ago. If you were to raise the cap to get to that, uh, that uh, where we capture 91% of the country's income, raise the cap from $118,000 a year, then... It would be solvent until your professor's grandchild is dead. So clip that and repeat it back to him and tell him and tell you tell him tell you why you're wrong. And also tell him that that 20 that 2036, there are three different levels of estimates of Social Security's uh, longevity. And that is just the uh, that is the most conservative one which has always been consistently less. I mean, uh, consistently, like, uh, under, uh, uh, pe- has been consistently pessimistic. Joseph Bollin, if you think I'm just making this shit up, look up Aaron Mate, who used to work at Democracy Now!, or the Black Agenda report about Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman. Let's talk about Democracy Now!'s coverage about the ongoing ethnic cleansing pushing people off their lands of Arabs and Yazidis committed by the Kurds. Let's talk about uh, uh, why am I sitting here having to defend the Amy Goodman show? 
We have not said anything about the Arabs and the Yazidis or the Kurds. Let's talk about Amy Goodman bringing on the Al-Qaeda white helmets. Oh, the white helmets, I see. She didn't even bring up Seymour Hersh's reporting revealing U.S. government uh, lied about the Syrian chemical attack. It's not just the U.S. government anymore. It's the U.N. You want me to read an article from Global Research about democracy now? Who the fuck is Global Research? <laughs> Dude, I don't know what to tell you. If you're, if, you're, if you're convinced that democracy now is our neoliberal shells. You know, Neoconservative like, is what he was saying. Neoconservative, excuse me. All I can tell you is I'd give up. <laughs> Honestly, like I, it's bunker time for you, dude. It's bunker time. I'm just saying this as someone who's not necessarily a friend, but someone who reads your IMs. <laughs> it's bunker time. Uh... I live in Tennessee. Marsha Blackburn is horrible. She has a degree in home ec. <laughs> Crystal Packer. With that. I'm politically incorrect too. Marsha Blackburn is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wanted me to tell you not to read that. Actually. Oh. All right. Well, you, it's a little late. Let me correct that. She's a muckle, uh, knuckle dragging one. Uh, I take it back. Calling her a knuckle dragger was kind of harsh. I'm sorry. I get carried away sometimes. Okay, I shouldn't call her the C word, but I didn't want people to think I was talking about her being a card carrying conservative. I apologize that people might have been little bitches about that last joke. <laughs> All right, Chris Lapaco. Chris Lapaco. Now you have Brendan Fenton. Brendan Fenton, you. Coach McGurk on the show intro. I think Kelly should be Melissa. Michael can be Jason, and Matt can be Perry. If you're changing names, might as well go all the way. I that didn't follow it. that. Is that a home movies That's reference? That's a home movies reference. Now that we have uh, Bren Bren here, I was Fenton. Jamie is, was, is playing Melissa's role. Antifa Melissa. Antifa Melissa. Did you ever see home movies? That was before your time. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Did you know I was Fenton? I did not. Hey, Bren Bren. <laughs> Oh, my God. That's so cool. Uh, Sammy Camera One. Another huge contributor to me bubbles is the fact that search engines and news sites use browsing history, social media connections, and algorithms to customize content. News depends on your politics and interests. I think we've talked to a couple of people about that in the past. All right. Um, I'm going to do. Jeffrey Epstein was who we talked to. Specifically. Six more. OK. Uh, MR member. Hi, Sam. It's now come out that Corker was eliminated from consideration early vetting process after he needed a boost up to grab some uh, some pussy. Uh, Matt uh, may have beat me to that joke. Did he say? Ri All right. Sensor sweep. It's actually really easy to uh, trim a cat's claws, but declawing a cat is equivalent to removing the first knuckle of each of your fingers. Oh, God, that's horrible. Although I fully support removing the fingertips of the ruling class. <laughs> Hell yeah. John, Johnny Ball game. Uh, I'm from Tennessee, and thanks to Marsha Blackburn, I can no longer buy baby ears, toes, or tongues. I now have to cross the border into Georgia to get my supply. Hugo Ball, too. Uh, what was the line Blackburn ad referencing when she said growing too much, like agriculture or population? I didn't get that one. I think the idea is the government is expanding, which is not true as far as I understand. No, it is not. Ear, I think Pod Save America and the Crooked Media Empire is actually an illustration of the danger on the left of epimistic uh, closure that McKay Coppins was talking about. By the way, thumbs down on Ska Poupe. I haven't listened. Uh, I think there's something to, to that epistemic saves. closure being a bigger problem in those circles than, I mean, it's a problem on the left, but I can see it there, I feel like. Well, they're much more partisan, I think. And I think that's problematic. What's that? Ferret? Ferret. Oh, ver oh. <laughs> yeah, I would put that in a slightly different category. Hasn't that closed already? Is that done? I want to know where their offices are because I need some office furniture. <laughs> I get some uh, Alex Galdwin. Hi, Sam. I'm the I am Mary emailer. Oh, okay. We already spoke to you. Um, left is preferable. 
I think Jimmy Dore fills the useful idiot role for the right, and I would not be surprised if some right winger is funding a show just as when Al Sharpton ran for president, the majority of its funding came from the right. Every time Dore convinces a voter not to vote or vote for the person with the Green New Deal, he's served his purpose. I don't think that's where his funding comes from, but I think there's something else driving him. Jorge, the bad hombre. Hello, crew. I wanted uh, to welcome Jamie and Brendan. Their help is much needed. Just wondering when Melissa and Jason will join Brendan. Wow, that's... Uh, Jay Tingle. Right, Weinstein's law firm was making big donations to Cy Vance. Seems very corrupt. Also, welcome New Patrick. Bunker time is a bit rich coming from you, Sam. Could be a shortage of toes in Georgia. And the final I am of the day... Jamie, give me a letter. A letter? Yeah, a letter. Like a letter of the alphabet? I don't know. Do you have a different letter? Do you want to actually send me? No, give me a, a letter of the alphabet. Um, D. D it is. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see if she could do this. She did it. Denver Dave. Sam, Jay Rosen has been complaining for more than a decade about public broadcasting ceding terrain to conservatives for the sake of preserving so-called journalistic objectivity. It amounts to he said, she said, opinionated load balancing. Anyone who believes that NPR and PAS are liberal need to understand that the public service journalism demands support of shows like The Majority Report. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Where you don't get paid For the road that bends Before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive